Now we'll go to our next speaker, Dr. Stephen Pross. He's uh, close to me. <laughs> and Stephen is a nuclear medicine physician. He's the chief of nuclear medicine at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal. He has special interest in teranastic and PSME PET. Uh, his his uh, talk will be about describing what steps need to be taken by various stakeholders to ensure equitable uh, <coughs> radio ligand therapy implement access to patients from coast to coast. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, um, building equitable access to PSMA radio ligand therapy is definitely going to be challenging. Um, these are my disclosures of uh, conflicts of interest, so you'll see that AAA and Novartis are on that list. Um, of course, the, the Vision PSMA Theranostic pair, uh, as you've seen, was uh, PSMA 11 and PSMA 617. Uh, the PSMA 11 was loaded with gallium 68, and the uh, PSMA 17 loaded with lutetium 177. You'll notice the conserve pharmacophore, which is the business end of the molecule. So, in order to get a PSMA radial ligand uh, therapy program off the ground, you have to play in both of these spaces. And one is going to be significantly more complicated than the other. Um, the first thing you have to realize is that the way we read scans when we're looking at um, PSMA radial ligand therapy and radial ligand therapy in general is different than the way we read scans when we're looking for diagnosis. And that's because diagnostic positivity does not equal theranostic positivity. This is a PYL scan and an FTG scan in the same patient done approximately two days apart. And I'll highlight for you this node here, which is diagnostically positive. I know that that's a prostate cancer nodal metastasis. I know that because the, P the FTG scan right next door uh, tells me that. Um, however, that's not a theranostically positive uh, lymph node in the sense that I could never get enough beta particles in there to make a difference. This, however, is a theranostically positive lymph node, which interestingly doesn't pick up an AFTG. So this is polyclonal disease. Um, most of the theranostic positivity work is actually imported from the neuroendocrine tumor space. And this is the, the famous Krenning score by Eric Krenning, which was largely copied for the PSMA um, uh, space and uh, it uses the liver as kind of the deciding the cutoff. So Krenning 1 was below the liver, Krenning 2 was about equal to the liver, and then 3 and 4 were more intense than the liver and then very, very intense. Um, in the registrational NETR1 trial, 90% of the patients were, um, were, were Krenning 3 and Krenning 4. So this was the, the, this was the framework that the people that designed the vision trial came, came up with. Um, we are actually fortunate and unfortunate in the PSMA space in that we have a lot of different ligands, a lot of different scanning options. Um, the reason we're unfortunate is because none of these are Health Canada approved, as you've heard. Um, in the PET space, DCFPYL, PSMA 11, PSMA 1007 are just the beginning. There's tons of other PET tracers, both fluorinated and gallium based, um, that can do the trick when we're looking for PSMA positivity. I want to not forget about the gamma imaging and spec agents. Um, MIP1404 was a molecule that was uh, developed by Progenix, uh, for molecular inside pharmaceuticals and then Progenix. It was abandoned, um, or at least I haven't heard about it in about, in about five or six years, but these are molecules that have maybe should get a, a second look uh, for, the, for the indications of PSMA positivity assessment, looking at radio ligand therapy. Technetium 99 iPSMA, is another option. Oh, I've lost my, can I get my slide back? Well, the most important, it's your <laughs> Great, so technetium, technetium 99M iPSMA is another technetium PSMA ligand. And of course you can use low doses or even high doses of lutetium PSMA 617 to determine theranostic positivity. So these are, these are uh, um, gamma imaging spec agents should get another look for the simple reason that we have so many more spec cameras than we do PET cameras installed in Canada. So in 2020, I wasn't able to find number uh, data from, from this year, but in 2020, we had 57 PET CT units across, across the country and 576 gamma cameras or SPECT CT units. So this is why leveraging these SPECT agents, although they are clearly inferior to the PET agents, may enable more equitable 
um, radio ligand therapy, um, a rollout that's more equitable where it's not just available to the big centers in the big cities. So this is something that we need to look at as a community. Um, we've talked about gallium PSMA11 and DCFPYL. This is a head-to-head. -head. This is the same patient imaged a few days apart as part of a research protocol. And I don't know how my colleagues feel about this, but my personal feeling is that these are clinically equivalent. So don't don't try it and find one or find the other. Whichever one you can get is going to be good enough, especially for this indication. Of course, PYL is a little bit nicer to work with with the half life and the image quality. You've seen this flow chart. Uh, this is the Vision PSMA positivity flow chart. So if you've never read a PET scan, I've never read a PSMA PET scan before, but you want to get started, this is actually all you need. You look at the you look at the MIP, you look at the coronal images, you find one or more lesions that are hotter than the liver, equal doesn't qualify. And then you look at the CT and the MRI to look for lymph nodes greater than 2.5 or parenchymal metastasis greater than one. And you make sure those are all also positive greater than the liver. If you find no negative lesions and you have at least one positive lesion, the patient's in. So it's really that simple. So, so although yes, education is going to be important. Yes, training is going to be important. Um, this flowchart, if you want to do a pure vision read, this flowchart is remarkably simple and straightforward. And I think any of any of us who have ever read a PET scan can follow this. Um, if you do a pure vision read, unfortunately, you miss a lot of information. And therapy is the trial that tried to leverage that information, which is with FDG PET concordance testing. You'll notice that the vision uh, positive the flow chart that I showed you doesn't have bone scan anywhere in it. That's because um, bone scans were not used for concordance testing in the vision trial. Uh, in fact, you can't use bone scans for concordance testing. The only way you can look for concordance inside the bone is with FDG PET. This was a very, a very um, striking example of a discordant disease where the patient had a FDG positive uh, bone metastasis here in the sacrum, which was PSMA negative. So the, the 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 bone is a complete blind spot if you're not doing FDG PET. So that begs the question: Do patients need two PET scans? Is that going to be an additional barrier to uh, to uh, doing? Uh, PSMA radio ligand therapy. And I argue that it shouldn't. If you can get the PSMA PET, don't worry about the FDG PET. If your PET scans are a limited resource, I would say use the vision criteria, use the one PET scan, and, and accept that you're going to be uh, evidence-based. Um, if you do a quick cross-trial comparison, which obviously is dangerous because the patient populations were not identical, although they were very similar, you'll notice that the, um, the therapy trial on the left side of the screen in green excluded 28% of the patients that they screened based on imaging, but had a 66% PSA 50 response rate, whereas the vision trial excluded 12% of patients, but had a 46% PSA 50 response rate. So you got 20% more patients with a PSA 50 RR, but you excluded 16%. And that makes a lot of sense. The more selective you are, the better your response is, the better candidates you're selecting for therapy. Which is the right answer? I don't think we know. I don't think we really have the, the answer of which is the right way to do it. But I would say, again, if you can get the PSMA PET and the FDG is a problem, don't let that be a barrier. Let's talk a little about, about hospital resources. Let's get out we'll drill down into the kind of the nitty gritty. And, and the, way, the way I see it is this, there's four levels of hospitals. The level one hospitals have nuclear medicine department, they have a PET scanner, and they have a PSMA PET investigator initiated trial. So they have all the pieces of the puzzle. The level two, the level two uh, centers have a nuclear medicine at PET, but no access to PSMA PET under IIT. And level three has just nuclear medicine. And if you're unfortunately level four, then you have none of the above. So let's go one by one and see what each center, what each of these hospitals need to do to put this all together. The level one hospital has all the pieces, all the pieces of the puzzle. The pieces of the puzzle are a nuclear medicine department where you can inject PSMA 617, a PET scanner where you can generate PET images, and a PSMA PET investigator initiated trial. It's very important that this be an investigator initiated trial because you want to be able to scan the patients to then go on for therapy. If you have PSMA PET, but you're scanning under PSMA addition, PSMA 4, or SPLASH, or another a sponsored trial, you're not scanning the patients that you could potentially send to PSMA therapy. So if all the pieces of the puzzle are together, all you got to do is identify the key people and, and get those people to, to, put, to, put their, to put everything together in place. 
nuclear medicine and medical oncology are going to be the key clinical departments. They're going to design patient flow, create protocols, assign space, time, train the technologists, stuff that's the, you know, that you've already seen. Pharmacy is going to approve it. They're going to supply the pre-meds. Hospital admin always wants to be involved. And the RSO is going to be able to add the isotopes that you need to your license and create radio protection protocols. If you are a level two hospital, that is to say you have nuclear medicine and PET, you can, you have two options. You can convert yourself into a level one hospital. This is the only realistic conversion in this framework. And this is by starting a PSMA PET IIT investigator initiated trial CTA or operating under SAP. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Or option number two is you have to establish a service corridor with a level one hospital. I think patients should be treated locally in the sense that if you're a level two hospital, you don't have PSMA PET, you have someone down the street who does, you send them for the PET scanner and then you take the patient back and you treat the patient locally. As we've mentioned, none of the PSMA PET nor spec ligands are currently Health Canada approval. So how do you inject non-approved substances into a human? You have two choices, SAP or CTA. The special access program is a patient specific request. This is a seven page form that you have to complete for every patient and, and ask Health Canada for approval. Usually 24 to 48 business hours later, Health Canada will fax you back an approval if you filled out that form correctly. Um, this is an option, but it's obviously a low volume option because you don't wanna be filling out seven page forms if you have a high volume of patients. But this could be a way to get started early on if you uh, don't have access to a clinical trial. The preferred access right now to the PSMA PET uh, ligands is an investigator initiated trial. The reason this is so important is because you have to be able to scan who you want to scan. You have to be able to scan the patients who are clinically indicated for PSMA 617. You write a protocol once and you can scan as many patients as you ask for. So if you ask for 2,000 patients, you get 2,000 patients. As long as your REB approves it and Health Canada approves it, you're off to the races. Good news, there's an easy route for PSMA 11, okay? So a multi-center investigator-initiated CTA is actually already in place. In Quebec, we have four centers active on this protocol. Um, the only deal is, the only, the only caveat is that you have to own a PET scanner and you have to BYO money. So if you have a money, if you have money and you have a PET scanner, money for the tracer, not for anything else, but if you have money and you want access to PSMA 11, send me an email or get a hold of me and we'll try and get you set up um, on this, on this um, CTA. If you're a level three hospital, that is to say you don't have PET and you're not gonna get a PET, the only, option are, the only options are to establish a service corridor with a level one hospital for PSMA PET. And then again, I suggest you bring your patients back for therapy. If you have nothing, you have no choice. Um, models of cooperation, there's different level models of cooperation, nuclear medicine and medical oncology. And I've seen three different kind of roles for nuclear medicine, and I'm just going to briefly touch on them. Um, some, some, in some places that you go to, nuclear medicine is really an imaging and infusion center. The patient gets sent in, we get the scan, the report comes out, you send a patient a request in, the drug gets given, the patient comes out, and really their only role is to do the imaging and do the infusion. In some centers that I know, um, nuclear medicine effectively acts as medical oncology. They're gonna see the patients in clinic, they're gonna do physical exams, they're gonna order CBCs, labs, they're gonna follow their patients, they're gonna order ancillary imaging, and they're effectively acting like medical oncologists. And of course, there's the middle ground. The middle ground is kind of where I see the Jewish being, the, where, where I practice. Um, this is kind of what we're doing. We don't consider ourselves an imaging and infusion center, but we definitely aren't medical oncologists. Yeah, I look at the CBCs, I look at the chemistry, I look at the CTs, I look at the bone scans, but I don't order them. And I, I, I haven't done a physical exam on a patient in quite a while. The patient flow is very simple. The patients, of course, are identified in medical oncology. The first thing that happens, the first thing that triggers all this is a PSMA PET requisition, which gets faxed down or emailed down to nuclear medicine. Nuclear medicine will perform the imaging, will perform the FDG if we, if we need to, and then we'll administer the first cycle. After this, we send the patient back to uh, medical oncology for clinical follow-up. The clinician will sign, sign off on the second, and third, and fourth doses and then we'll administer those doses. So we do ask that the patients be seen in medical oncology in between every cycle. 
our therapy protocol, you've seen one. I'm just going to share with you mine very quickly. We're uh, very, very, uh, keep it really simple. Uh, the patients are in and out of the department in 30 minutes. We, um, we, we start the IV, we give some PO pre-meds, we push the dose over about a minute, a manual IV push, no pump. And basically by the time the patient's discharged, we, we discharge the patient by the time the catheter is out there, good to go. We do whole body imaging the next day. I think that is important. Um, it's optional, it's not on the product monograph, I believe, but you can catch things, um, you can catch progressing. Uh, lesions, you can catch responders. This is a patient, this is the same patient over his six cycles of PSMA 617. So he started off with a PSA 28, you see lots of lesions. By cycle three, cycle four, those lesions have all melted away. But you see as the PSA starts to tick back up, 1532, the lesions start to come back. So this gentleman progressed with PSMA positive disease, which can happen. You can also progress with PSMA negative disease. Um, this post-therapy imaging does not obviate the need for continued follow-up with your conventional imaging CT and bone scan, so continue to do those. But, but we think the post-therapy imaging is, is valuable information, and it's free, if you will. It's a poor man's PSMA pet. Um, the therapy protocols that we have at the Jewish, you'll notice radium and lutetium are, are equally, are very similar. The difference is that we do imaging for lutetium and we give some pre-meds for lutetium. Otherwise, it's very similar. The department time, 30 minutes, infusion time, one minute, no co-meds. Uh, it's very, very different than, of course, lutetium tape, which is something that you guys probably are familiar with. Uh, we talked about the future, so I'm going to talk about the future a little bit too. I think Theranostics is just beginning, and I think we have to, uh, yeah, we just got our approval for PSMA 617, but but uh, we have to be ready for the other, th other stuff that's coming online. So the FAPI stuff, the fibroblast activation protein inhibitors, this is pan cancer, so this is not prostate specific, very exciting. Uh, it seems to be the challenge now, the imaging seems to be solved for FAPI and the problem seems to be getting the, the molecules to stick, have a residence time in the tumors to get some therapy in there. But you'll notice super, super high tumor to background ratios. And Bombas and Theranostics is also a, something that's uh, up and coming. So keep keep your uh, ears uh, peeled for this uh, exciting Theranostics, very exciting time to be in nuclear medicine. So in conclusion, I think uh, equitable access to PSMA RLT will be a challenge. I think, uh, I think that's a given. I, I don't think we can count on the government to coordinate all this stuff. So I think it's gonna be up to us as a community to make this happen. And uh, I think I've given at least, or I hope that I've given um, ideas for each of you at your centers, depending on if you're level one or two or whatnot, uh, what you can do to to get to get a program off the ground. And uh, if there's anything I could do to help, uh, feel free to reach out because uh, I make myself available. And that's it. And I think now is the time for questions. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you so much, the three of you. Patrick, Catherine, and Stephen for those very, very interesting presentation. I'm sure there is a lot of question or comments. So the floor is yours. We have at least 10 minutes to proceed. So come to the microphone if you have any comment or any question to any of our speakers. I know this guy, Phil Cohen. Really just a general question and comment to all the speakers. Uh, in Quebec, where there's probably about 30 PET scanners, I think doing some of the things that have been advocated are correct and probably will happen. But in English Canada, especially in my province, British Columbia and Ontario, uh, we have four PET scanners in British Columbia and uh, in the greater Toronto area, I'm sure they don't have many more than that. Uh, the time frame for my hospital, which is more or less a community hospital, to acquire any additional piece of equipment is about two years. We do not have two years uh, to uh, really do these patients. They're going to start coming as soon as they are aware that the uh, scans and the therapies are available. Um, I don't see us getting any government reimbursement in English Canada. They've gone out of their way to make sure that PET is not reimbursed. So given all that, does anybody have anything more optimistic that they see on the horizon? Well, I, I will let the speaker. <laughs> Any of you or I could have a comment, two things. 
in Canada, there is a law, federal law, saying that we every citizen is allowed to have access to the same quality of medicine. So we must make aware the patient, the general public, the politicians, and it's one of the aim of the association, the Canadian Association, to make it known better. The other thing is, I think the other province in Canada should follow what we have, how we, we work in Quebec, meaning we, uh, the PSMA, or any test we do in nuclear medicine is reimbursed, because the way we proceed for the professional fee is a number. This number is 8703. It's a PET study, any kind of PET study. We don't need, when we introduce a new test, when you examine, either in diagnostic or in uh, diagnostic, we don't need to negotiate with the government. The other thing, the third thing, the budget is, is the general budget of the hospital. So we have immediately access, but it's completely different in the rest of the province. But I think the biggest pressure will come for the patient because we can see, we know we are the, the, the specialists in these fields and we see what's the benefit for the patient and we cannot have two standards. So I think it, maybe I'm more positive. I, I think it will come. That's my opinion. I don't know, you are the one. one. I will have a question. Uh, we have some center, uh, Patrick, Catherine, and Stephen have shown us. Any of your two speakers, can we send, I work for example in Val d'Or, can I send a patient to your hospital? And what is the waiting list? Catherine, you want to feel this one? Or uh, sure, I can start with this. So um, first to answer, I'm also more optimistic uh, than I have been in a while. And part of that is that PSMA RLT, for better or for worse, it's the poster child. We have a large population who will benefit from it. Not only that, but <laughs> and maybe I don't know how to say this in a politically correct way, but many of these people are older, well-placed men with money. When you have <laughs> them, you have a force. And so there is a chance that if we can play our cards right, this will pave the way for the future when there are more orphan type therapies that are smaller populations. So I would say this is a real chance we have right now. And it's very important that we play our cards right now. In terms of where we send patients, so um, I was a believer in PSMA PET. Oh my goodness. I think the first time was back in 2014 when I saw it and I started to say, this is the way to go. And you couldn't get it for love or money in Hamilton in the early days. So I sent my patients to uh, the Jewish general, actually. <laughs> um, so there are ways. Um, I think right now we really have to advocate for increasing the resources across the country. Our wait time still for getting a PSMA pet, right now they're booking into December. That's a long ways out when you think that we're still the end of September uh, and that, you know, therapy is coming. And the issue is that there's a lot of oncology. So you, you simply, I think the issue will be less with the actual therapy and more with the patient selection in terms of the imaging, because we need more equipment. So how can we advocate for this? It is expensive, but it's not that expensive. We ought to be able to get this up and running. And over to you, Patrick, anything you well, wanna add? <laughs> I just want to say I'm really glad you're the one who pointed that out. Um, but I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, we're going to be dealing with a patient population that is relatively well off. Um, I think that's definitely going to play in our favor. Uh, I definitely hear what Dr. Cohen's saying, um, but I'm I'm banking on strong patient advocacy to really drive this forward. Um, you know, we can bang our head against the wall and go, yeah, I need a new PET scanner. It doesn't mean that much when it comes from me. If there's a thousand older gentlemen with deep pockets saying the same thing, that's much louder and the government recognizes these are voters and taxpayers 
and it's much more meaningful as a message. Um, so if we were dealing with a more niche indication, then I would be much more pessimistic than I am now. But as far as indications for patients that have the ability to change political um, political stages, shall we say, prostate cancer is the most you could is the best you could possibly hope for. Uh, and if we find ourselves with a breast cancer agent next, which I think is actually in the cards, forget it. Uh, we'll get what we need. Um, so I understand right now. Um, I can understand the people's perspective being um, very pessimistic. Um, but I think if we're patient and in the specialty, I think we have to be patient, right? This is a field that evolves extremely slowly. I think we should a be struck at how remarkable it is that we've made any progress. <clears throat> Frankly, we have an approved agent. We should have a party. Um, a pet agent will follow in short order. I'm confident of that. Um, and the infrastructure we need once patients start banging on doors, I think it will be provided. But the time scale will likely be several years. Uh, it's not going to be six months. Stephen, any comment? Yeah, so we, we definitely have scanned patients that are out of our center and we're, we're open to doing that. Unfortunately, that's not a viable solution in the long term because if I just say, hey, everybody send me your patients, then my wait list tomorrow becomes six months and then the program essentially dies. So my focus has been to get other centers up and running. That's really, I think, the long-term solution. So much, I would much rather get a phone call from another nuclear medicine physician saying, hey, you have PSMA PET, how can I get PSMA PET than, hey, can you scan my patient? I would much rather field the first phone call. Uh, but of course, yeah, we've scanned patients from other centers and, and, and we'll continue to do so at, at small volumes as, as our capacity allows us to. Any question from the floor? Could you identify yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, John Abel Johnny. from Edmonton. Um, I haven't practiced therapy for many, many years, so I may be way out to lunch here. But when I think back to my residency days and thyroid cancer, you know, typically the patient would have their surgery, have an ablation, the thyroglobulin would drop to zero. And if you saw the thyroglobulin rising, you would treat with I-131 and assess the post-therapy scan to see if there was disease, at least give it one attempt. And I just wonder with this, why are we using a different analogy where we have to do a diagnostic scan first? If you've done a prostatectomy, you know, particularly the biochemical recurrence group, if you've treated the patient, the PSA drops down and now you see it rising, why wouldn't you just try one therapy and do a, do a post-PIP therapy scan and see if anything takes anything up? Right, so you absolutely could do that. You could take every MCRPC post-attack sane post an ARAT and give them one dose of Pluvicto and then do a post-therapy scan and see if it's PSMA positive. The difference is that that's going to cost you $27,000 to find out. So, and it's not an insignificant side effect profile. But yeah, that's that that's not crazy. You know, the screen fail rate in vision was 13%, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. So, you 13% of those men you can find out post cycle one. Bring them back for the images that I show you, and and you can assess PSMA positive like that. That's not how the label is, so I don't think the payers are going to go for that. The payers are not going to pay for the first cycle and and then say, oh, we'll find out after cycle one. I think the payers are going to insist that the patient have PSMA positivity, however that's defined, pre-cycle one. But that's not a crazy idea at all. Thank you. Is there another comment, a question? If not, I have a question for any of you three. Do you think it's, it is mandatory to have personalized dosimetry for each of those patients? Mandatory? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it's mandatory. No, no, no. I'm asking it, it should be mandatory. Oh, should it be mandatory? Uh, you, you know, we're talking about equitable access and getting this in the hand, in the, you know, in the arms of as many patients as possible. Uh, dosimetry is beautiful and great and it has its place. But right now, I'm just focused on getting the patients the drug. And, and, and if dosimetry is going to be an additional barrier to getting more patients the drug, um, then I, I think we should uh, stick with the vision protocol, 200 millicuries with uh, dose adjustments as per product monograph. Okay. Thank you.
Eh. Dr. Bito. Hey. <coughs> Excuse me, yeah, James Bito from Peter Mac. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for the talks. I was, uh, it's nice to hear actually that like I'm a strong believer in the FTG. It makes a really big difference, but obviously there's some uh, difficulty for access, you know, PSMA, let alone, you know, adding on an FTG. Um, I was just curious about your, do you actually do FTG for all the patients receiving Loop PSMA? And do you know if there are other sites in Canada giving uh, PSMA RLT or, you know, on protocols? Like, you, do you have any, you don't have any um, compassionate access yet, I guess. You do? Okay, okay. I could just yeah, elaborate so we, a bit we were, on that. We were, oper we were operating under a managed access program, a Novartis managed access program. And uh, I think we give around 70, 70 odd cycles under the MAP. The MAP shut down when Health Canada gave the approval. So we, we got a, a taste of clinical PSMA 617 because these were treat who you want to treat, do what you want to do. There was nobody, it was free drug from Novartis, but essentially clinical, clinical drug under special access. Health Canada authorized it under special access. Novartis under, uh, uh, authorized under managed access. Um, we did FDG for, I'd say, about half of the patients when when it was very, very clear. And I, we did the PSMA first, and if there was absolutely no question, uh, it was like a super strong positivity everywhere. I had no no concerns. We skipped the FDG, but we did FDG on about half of the patients. Okay. Thanks. And I was just curious, have you done any whole body spec post-therapy imaging? Uh, like, basically, we, do, we don't do any planar. We just do that whole body spec, not a huge amount more of time. Just curious what your thoughts of that are because it can add a lot of uh, value uh, down the track for kind of like you said, it's like a free man pet, a poor man pet. Poor man's pet, yeah. yeah. So we did, we did, we did, everybody got planers and then the, and then it was spec PRN. It was kind of like, a, it was the, the way we do bone scanning. You know, everyone gets a whole body bone scan planer, at least at my center, everyone gets a whole body planer. And then if there's a question or concern, whatever, then the, the, the physician has the opportunity to add the spec. So the spec was not um, a routine thing. Okay, thanks. And do you know if there are other sites, last question, uh, other sites across Canada that have been giving compassionate access? Or... I know McGill gave a few. I'll let yeah. my colleagues. Mm, it's pretty limited. Dr. Zukatinsky and Dr. Martineau, did you know people who were giving um, compassionate access or special access dosing? No. We were only doing it on, on clinical trials, you can do it, but uh, outside of clinical trials, no. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Could you identify yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, Frédéric Arsenault from Quebec City. So we've been treating patients with special access program with the PSMA. We're uh, around at 50 patients uh, uh, recruited on our special access program. So we, we have roughly 300 cycles given, and we... we we tried to do FDG prior to do PSMA uh, treatment, but some of the time we, we, since it's a compassionate uh, treatment, we ask ourselves, why are we giving the treatment? And if even if there's a discrepancy between the FDG and the PSMA PET, we would give the treatment to some patient if we think uh, the, the, the patient would benefit from the treatment. Let's say a patient would have uh, difficulty uh, or pain in the, in the, the, the abdomen, and most of the, the lesion uh, are FDG, uh, are PSMA positive in the abdomen, we would then give the treatment to see if we can at least uh, le lessen the burden of the tumor to the patient and try to, to, to give better quality of life. So this is how we see the, the treatment at end of, end of life treatment. But if we give it prior to a, a cabezitaxel or other treatment, then we would consider maybe otherwise. Thank you. Uh, just an additional comment. I think that's a really good point. And like, obviously, there are two objectives for patients, you know, living longer and living better. And we have treated, like with our compassionate access, we have also been giving these treatments just to improve quality of life. So I think it, it can make a really big difference from experience. And so thanks for the comment. Okay, then it will end our session. I want to, on behalf oh, yeah, of you, oh, one, there is one, one comment. comment. Sorry, uh, Gordon. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, could you identify yourself? Reza Berenji from Los Angeles, and we've been using uh, lutetium PSMA as compassionate use, and now we're doing clinical for some time. 
But just a comment about FDG, and we do FDG on all patients. What we use it for is to give a patient an idea of what they're expecting. So the prognostic value was important because we have to consider the fact that patients coming with a lot of hope. And if we know that they may not respond very well, it's good to, to tell them ahead of time. So, And in my experience, people with liver disease, it's pretty important to do the FDG because uh, few patients that I had with uh, liver disease and extensive FDG uptake, they didn't even do well after the first therapy. So that's that's the important thing to to do. And the second comment is about patient advocacy. That's that was very important when I started the investigator initiated PSMA imaging. Some of the people that were running the forums for prostate cancer, they actually came to get the scan themselves, and then they propagated and it kind of spread the word. So the patients were really waiting for the imaging as it became available. Medicare started working on it and they got it approved and for the therapy is the same. So, uh, uh, and I think uh, having an outreach program, going and giving lectures both to patients and the treating physicians, that's very important. So spread the word and that's other speakers said, uh, one word from Patients works a lot more than work coming from our as physicians. Thank you. If there is no more question, I will just on behalf of you, thanks uh, Dr. Martino, Dr. Zukonski, and Dr. Pross again. Very, very interesting uh, session.